Hello, and welcome to the kickoff to uh, conversations on innovation, new thinking, and new approaches. This series is sponsored by the Center for Innovation Policy at Duke Law, um, and is co-sponsored by the Duke Law Center for International and Comparative Law. I'm Stuart Benjamin, a professor at Duke Law School and co-director of the Center for Innovation Policy. I'm joined by the other co-director of the center, Artie Rye, who's also a professor at Duke Law, and by the center's executive director, Dennis Simon, who is also a professor of the practice at Duke's Fuqua Business School. Uh, the idea behind this center and the seminar series is to analyze important innovation issues that are on the horizon. We're a forum for independent nonpartisan analysis and balanced discussion of policies for promoting technological innovation that enhances long-term social welfare, and today's event highlights that. You can find much more about us on our website. Um, a couple of quick notes before I turn this over to Artie. Uh, this event is being um, recorded. Um, you can ask questions at any time using the Q&A function, and we'll get to as many of your questions as time allows. Um, and if you need any help with technical problems, you can also use the Q&A function and someone will work with you to resolve the issue. So without any further ado, let me turn this over to Artie. Uh, Artie? Good afternoon and thank you, Stuart. We are delighted to launch our innovation conversation series with a big picture analysis of the role of the federal government in innovation policy and technology strategy, particularly in the face of competitiveness challenges from China. Our subsequent conversations will focus on more specific hot topics in innovation policy, but we have started big and we have two speakers who are very willing to take on the big picture issues. And so we are delighted to have them. Before I introduce them, let me just give some raw uh, facts and background that will help to frame our conversation a little bit. So as many of you probably know, federal spending on research and development has fallen from about 1.5% of GDP in the early 1960s to around 0.6% today. Some have argued that the research situation is actually even more dire than these statistics would indicate. And that's because the private sector, although it has stepped up on R&D, is orienting its focus primarily to the development end of the spectrum. Additionally, some would argue that even the federal expenditures we have are tilted to perhaps too much in favor of the biomedical sciences, not that the biomedical sciences don't deserve that funding, but other areas, including the physical sciences and engineering, also need to be funded at equally high levels. And that's particularly true if one thinks that national security policy and innovation policy are intertwined. At the same time, and perhaps on the other side, there are voices who say that we should be wary in the United States of going too far in favor of so-called industrial policy. And there would be voices that say that innovation policy should take into account not only competitiveness and economic growth and perhaps national security, but in addition, environmental and equity concerns. Just recently, the House Science Committee held hearings on a number of different innovation bills, including the Endless Frontier Act, which has been discussed quite widely and our speakers will discuss it as well. It has strong bicameral and bipartisan support. Additionally, as part of its America Jobs Plan, the Biden administration has asked for about $250 billion in federal R&D spending, which is almost double what the prior administration proposed. Now, whether that's enough is another question. I think our speakers will speak to that question as well. So without further ado, I'm extremely pleased to introduce our two uh, terrific speakers. First up, we have Rob Atkinson, who is the founder and president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, which has been ranked as the world's leading think tank for science and technology policy. Rob leads a prolific team of policy analysts and fellows 
that is successfully shaping the debate and setting the agenda and a host of critical issues at the intersection of technological innovation and public policy. He's an internationally recognized scholar and a widely published author whom the New Republic has named, quote, one of the three most important thinkers about innovation, unquote. Washingtonian Magazine has called him a tech titan and Government Technology Magazine has judged him to be one of the 25 top doers, dreamers, and drivers of information technology. He's an extremely um, sought after speaker and valued advisor to policymakers around the world, as well as to every US administration since the Clinton administration. Most recently, he has written, or what, his most recent of a series of books is quote, Big is Beautiful, Debunking the Mythology of Small Business, which came out from MIT Press in 2018. He's also written numerous books on innovation economics and global advantage. And as mentioned, he's advised Democratic and Republican administrations since President Clinton. I could go on, but we have limited time. So I will move next to our equally distinguished second speaker, Jim Lewis. Jim Lewis is the senior vice president and director of the strategic technologies program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies or CSIS, another extremely well-respected think tank. Mr. Lewis or Jim has authored numerous publications on the relationship between technology, innovation, and national power. His current research examines international security and governance in cyberspace, the geopolitics of innovation, the future of warfare, and the effect of the internet on politics. So just a small um, slice of, of the world that uh, Jim is investigating. He's an internationally recognized expert in cybersecurity and technology and was, was one of the first to approach cybersecurity as a policy and strategic problem. His writings include the best-selling Cybersecurity for the 44th Presidency, which was the national security cybersecurity strategy cited by President Obama in the first speech by a US president on cybersecurity. And it became a template for cyber strategy in other countries. Jim was a rapporteur for the United Nations successful 2010, 2013, and 2015 group of government experts reports on information security, which also set the global agenda on cybersecurity. Before joining CSIS, Jim worked for the Departments of State and Commerce as a Foreign Service Officer and a member of the Senior Executive Service. So we're also extremely delighted to have Jim joining us today. So with that, perhaps we could get a few minutes from each of you on the current national conversation on federal R&D spending, technology strategy, and industrial policy, if one wants to call it that. And we'll start with Rob. Sure. Thank you, Artie. It's a pleasure. And Stuart, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, with everybody and my longtime colleague, Dennis, and, and obviously Jim. So I'm old enough to remember when I got my PhD at a really, I think the best university in North Carolina, UNC Chapel Hill, um, just kidding. I was never a Ducator, I love Duke. Um, but when I got my PhD there back in the 80s, it was a very vibrant conversation in the country about industrial policy or technology policy. And um, it's easy to forget about that, but there were so many people talking about it. It was bipartisan, it was Republican, it was Democrat, it was White House, it was, it was Congress. And in the 80s and early 90s, we passed a slew of legislation and programs that made the sort of new updated innovation strategy that we put in place in a de facto way after World War II um, with, with the response to the Cold War and the Russians or the Soviets, the Bayh-Dole Act, the R&D credit, the Federal Tech Transfer Act, uh, uh, re reviving NSF and some of the programs like the Engineering Research Center program recreating, renaming NIST and giving it new responsibilities like the MEP program and the Advanced Technology Program, the SBIR program, you know, on and on like that. And those programs shouldn't be underestimated. They help the US along with robust private sector action and innovation to come back to challenge the Japanese again and, and to do pretty well. And, and then two things happened. We got lazy 
we thought we had won because the internet happened and, and we were the unalloyed leaders in the IT internet economy, whether it was Wintelism at first or Silicon Valley and, and, and the big internet companies. And the second thing that happened was really the unfortunate, <laughs> offend maybe some economists here, the unfortunate rise and, and sort of intellectual dominance of a free market economics that really denied the legitimate role of government in spurring innovation and helping the private sector innovate. Um, you had economists who basically said, quote, there's nothing government can do about innovation. It's simply manna from heaven. And that really was the underlying thinking for a lot of years. It was just, well, you know, just let's just get the patent system right. Let's make sure we have a rule of law and maybe fund some basic research and everything will be fine. And two things happened that changed that. One was much better scholarship in the last 10 years by innovation economists to really point out that innovation systems are just that. They're not markets, they're systems that, that where there's complexity, there's all sorts of challenges that it's not just about market failures here and there, it's about an entire innovation ecosystem that governments need to be engaged in promoting. And then obviously the big elephant in the room and that's China. Uh, China now has made it clear that they are intending to become the world's innovation leader. They want to displace us in virtually every technology. And Congress, as a, res as a result, has recognized that and is responding in, in really unprecedented way, unprecedented in the last 20 years ways, like the CHIPS Act for the semiconductor industry, like this new China package that'll be coming out soon, and obviously the Endless Frontier Act. So. Um, we're not over the finish line yet by any stretch of the imagination. There's still very strong forces on both the right and the left, the right that would just say cut taxes and regulations and we don't want to, any kind of industrial strategy or tech strategy is becoming like the Chinese. Clearly that's wrong. And on the left, frankly, a, a, a denial of, of even that even the China's a threat to us, even that, in, that competition exists. Uh, and that all we should do is really focus on social welfare spending. Um, you know, so those are two extremes, if you will. The Biden administration certainly has advanced a set of policies that would, uh, proposals that would help with innovation as has Congress. So we keep our fingers crossed and hope that we make real progress there, kind of running down the middle of the field, if you will. So I'll stop there, thank you. Jim, a few words from you. Great, thank you, and thanks to everyone for showing up. So in the 19, Rob and I are gonna say things that are similar, but not exactly the same. In the 1990s, the US, uh, having decided that it had won the Cold War, uh, hold your applause, please, uh, decided it could mantle, dismantle the system that we had created in the 1950s to strengthen American science, technology, leadership. It was exceptionally successful in a number of countries, including China, have copied it, but we decided to get rid of it. The 90s were an interesting decade because you had first this Washington consensus, the idea that the whole world was moving in the direction of becoming market democracies. And second, you had this powerful sense uh, that we needed to shrink the government. Now, it's not entirely new. Every time the U.S. finishes a war, it tends to cut uh, budget. But in this case, it was based on some assumptions that were faulty. And the key assumption that was a mistake, although it wasn't clear that it was a mistake for years, was that China was going to be a friend, right? Um, we lost strategic focus, right? If you look at our opponents, uh, Vladimir Putin in 2009, Xi Jinping in 2012, uh, they decided to confront the United States. Uh, Putin gave a very a funny speech in some ways at the Munich Security Conference that said basically, I've had it with these Americans and them telling me what to do. Uh, so our opponents figured this out a decade ago that we were in a new kind of competition and it's not who has the most tanks or who has the most airplanes or who has the most, most nuclear weapons. It's a technological competition. It's an economic competition. It's a, tech, it's a competition over setting global standards. So um, we were unprepared for that. Uh, at that same time, this is the work that many of you have done, um, the nature of innovation changed. Whereas if you looked at say 1980, very much defense driven, defense played a large role in thinking about it. Uh, it was national innovation systems. 
that's not the case anymore. Um, it's a global innovation system, and it's largely driven by the private sector. And as already noticed in their opening remarks, they tend to focus a lot on the D, not entirely, not in all sectors. But while the U.S. spends a lot on R&D, it doesn't spend on enough to give you strategic advantage. And while the U.S. spends a lot uh, because of Newt Gingrich's decision on uh, biotechnology and bioscience, um, it doesn't spend enough on math, physics, chemistry, materials, computing, all the things you need for uh, competition, right? Um, DOD is now the tail on the dog of innovation. Uh, they don't drive it anymore. And this is crucial to bear in mind. One thing that we know and that Rob and I have argued for consistently is that US government funding is crucial, especially funding for basic research, right? There's no alternative. And the idea that we don't need to do that is simply foolish. It's only a good idea if you wanna to lose to China, right? So focusing on basic research is important. Trump, this is the only good thing I'll say about him, so I gotta get it out of the way. Um, he was right to call out China and their predatory trade policies, their immense uh, technological espionage, um, but he did not have a really good response. Uh, and that's where I think the Biden administration has some opportunities and we see some promising signs. So what do we need to do? I'll give you three things. First, we need to fund basic research, right? There, no one else is gonna do it. Uh, two, we need to rebuild the transatlantic partnership. Uh, that's going to be difficult because the Europeans don't trust us anymore. And they talk a lot about technological sovereignty or strategic autonomy. Uh, those are legitimate points of view from a European perspective. We have to persuade them, no, it's better if we work together. They're on the same trajectory as us when it comes to China. They are focused as we are on innovation. So there's room for partnership. Finally, and this is what I think we'll be talking about today in part, is we need a new model of industrial policy. What we did in the 20th century doesn't work anymore. The world has changed. I, this is why I'm at a think tank. I can have big thoughts like that. It's not the 20th century. A 20th century innovation system and industrial policy won't work. But defining what that new industrial policy looks like will be hard. Now, I'd note that in 2005, I wrote a report called uh, Waiting for Sputnik. Right. And the idea is what would it take for the US to um, get in gear and start moving out again on innovation and investing in research? And the theory was that we would need the moral equivalent of something flying over our heads going beep, beep, beep. And that would panic us and we would start putting money back in. I think that moment has happened. Right. I think people have woken up. There's a different debate about whether Xi Jinping was premature and pulling the trigger on announcing that China was. Uh, now going to return to a central place on the world stage. But make no doubt about it, the Chinese are willing to spend money. They are determined, they are aggressive. Uh, they will be formidable competitors. Uh, we have a real challenge. We're two decades behind. This administration and this Congress has started to doing the right things, but we've got a lot of catching up to do. So with that, I look forward to the conversation. Terrific. So you've given us, both of you have given us lots of food for thought. And so let me start with one historical uh, point or question. And that is both of you pointed to the 1980s as an era where we arguably had a sub rosa industrial policy. One of the interesting pieces of that was though that in on the face of it, Reaganism was all about markets. So could each of you comment on that question? Um, because I think you're absolutely right in terms of the legislation that was passed and also in terms of R&D funding um, as a percentage of GDP, it was pretty high. So if you could comment on that seeming paradox, um, Rob, perhaps you can go first and then Jim. Yeah, well, first of all, I don't, you know, it's hard to underestimate the fact that, you know, that Reagan wasn't as as much of a free market conservative as everybody believes. Uh, the takeover of economics, there were still a lot of Keynesians back then who didn't have a reflexive, you know, kill government, uh, the best governments, the small gov government kind of view. And so that was the world that Reaganism was, was embedded in. Obviously, he was much more free market than, than say, others. 
But secondly, um, he understood this from a national security perspective. So for example, he created the National uh, Competitiveness Commission that John Young from Hewlett Packard led. And that was an important um, group. I mean, by the way, that's, we should think about something like that again. John Young was an amazing, amazing leader. He was not just a very great CEO of Hewlett, but he was a statesman. And that commission, they were supportive of the R&D credit. They, so they, they were much more pragmatic. They were like, yeah, there are regulatory areas we need to fix to make the economy and business and innovation work better. There are issues on tax where we're maybe taxing too high. That's where, that was partly where the impetus for the lower capital gains tax came from. But they also were pragmatic enough to say, yeah, we need more, we need more R&D spending. And, and importantly, we need to be able to transfer technology more effectively, whether it's from federal labs or from universities. So I don't think there was a big contradiction there. Um, the other point that Jim made is uh, I wrote a recent piece for the um, Department of Defense journal called PRISM, and it argued that um, the US had the world's greatest national innovation system known to humans uh, after 1946, and it continued really through the 60s. Uh, in 19, early 1960s, the US government spent more on R&D than every other country and business outside the US combined. Uh, you know, that's why we led, uh, that's a big reason why we led. So I, I think it was really this big shift after that, which was about, you know, neoclassical economics. It was also, uh, you know, it's sad that John Williamson just passed away, but uh, the whole Washington consensus, frankly, nonsense, much of it, um, you know, that you just want to more focus on macroeconomic things and, you know, keep tax rates low. That was bad advice to governments back then, and it was, it's bad advice now, but now we're finally sort of waking up that well, maybe that wasn't exactly what we should have been doing. One of the reasons I don't have any hair is that my first year, I went to Chicago and my first year there, Milton Friedman patted me on the top of the head. So <laughs> I'm a little more Chicago school maybe than Rob, but you know, two things have changed. The first is uh, the Republican party and I don't want to be partisan. I, you know, have talked recently to the a senior Republican congressional member who said that if Ronald Reagan ran in a primary today, he would lose, right? Uh, and there's this term rhino, R-I-N-O, that many of you know, uh, Reagan. It's ironic in some ways that Eisenhower and Reagan were in many ways the people who built the Cold War innovation system. They were Republicans, um, but it will take a while for us to get back to that. The second big change is uh, DOD led innovation. They led innovation from the 1950s, really until the 19, in 1990s, certainly in the 1980s. And so when you look at levels of funding, when you look at many of the semiconductors, the internet, satellites, the list is endless. Um, DOD had a different role and people were willing to fund DOD, including Reagan. Uh, it helped to be in a contest that we appeared to be losing. Uh, that was what the case was when Reagan came in. Uh, I have a nice quote from the Soviet general staff about how well it was over socialism had triumphed in uh, ninth, the 1970s. So um, we had a sense of threat. Uh, we had a uh, strong framework built by two Republican presidents and we had a willingness to spend for national security. And I think that's beginning to change. People realize that we need national security requires funding for research and innovation, but it'll be a different kind of program than what we saw back then. So Reagan was great. Uh, I, people may not like that, but he he was much more a new dealer than any president we've had in a long time. Very interesting. That will be a, a quote to pull from this session. Reagan was very much a new, or more a new dealer than any president we've had in a long time. That's very interesting. Um, so uh, both of you are, have spoken then about DOD uh, previously having taken the lead on uh, technological innovation, maybe even industrial policy. For our new industrial policy, Jim, what you referred to as we'll need a new industrial policy, do you think DOD will be the place that should take the lead or where should we be looking for our new industrial policy if that's what we should want? Well, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. So uh, the private sector already spends so much more mm -hmm. on R&D. It, you may want it to be a little more R, a little SD, but if you look at quantum computing, if you look at artificial intelligence, uh, if you look at satellites, 
Uh, the innovation is in the private sector, and there's probably okay. I'll give I'll give DoD hypersonic strike vehicles, but beyond that, it's very much autonomous vehicles. So the private sector now leads, and we need to think of a system that uh, takes account of that. It's not going to. There was a senior uh, senator who said last year in funding the NDAA as well. Yeah, the private sector leads, and now they need to follow DOD in thinking what to do, and that's not going to happen, right? The money isn't there. You, if the returns are so much greater in the commercial market, you're not going back to the defense market without some new incentives, without some new uh, flexibility in our acquisition rules. The other thing is it's global, and so I knew it was global. Rob probably saw this too, but a few years ago, uh, United started a direct flight from Tel Aviv to Silicon Valley. Well, there's a hint there, folks. And so when you look at innovation centers around the world, many are here, we're very strong, but you've got Canada, you've got Israel, you've got the UK, you have Germany and the Scandinavian countries, you have Japan. It's a global system. China's in there too, but we have an advantage in that people are more likely to trust us and wanna work with us than they are with Xi Jinping. So uh, private sector driven, globally uh, open, um, that's what a new system will look like. And we're just starting to scope out what that will require. Rob, do you wanna give your thoughts on private sector driven global? Sure, I, you know, I, I'm glad Jim is here because we agree on a lot. And I, I, I just thought I don't disagree with that. I probably would put less emphasis on it then. Um, for example, I don't think that uh, I, I get very frustrated when I when I look, for example, at, at the Biden jobs plan and they kept using the word basic research, basic research. That's very, very much out of the neoclassical playbook that the only thing the government should do is basic research. I think that's uh, frankly a mistake. Uh, if you look at we did a report recently looking at the trends in corporate R&D over the last 20 years or so. Number one, it hasn't gone up as a share of GDP, which you would expect it would as the economy becomes more innovation based. But secondly, it's shifted over where the companies are doing less basic, but also less applied. So I think the federal government has to take a much stronger role or, or more active role in basic and applied. Well, one of the advantages of applied, if you look around the world, what you see is most of our competitors in their government policies are focused on applied, not basic, because they understand that basic is a fungible good that can knowledge and it goes around the world and it helps China, it helps our competitors. So we, we, we can no longer afford to be the global sort of, um, you know, public goods provider here. We have to focus on applied. With regard to the private sector, a lot of things the private sector doesn't do. Uh, you know, if, if you look, for example, at the, um, we just released a statement by about 15 or so leading uh, industrial tech policy experts. And one of the uh, people we had talked to in preparing that was Willie Shee at Harvard, uh, sorry, at MIT. And, and Willie was talking about this NASA program. I think he called it, I think it was E3, but it was about new kinds of engines uh, for aerospace. So that was a public private partnership where if the government didn't do that, frankly, the aerospace companies would not have done that. So I think there are lots and lots of areas like that. Robotics is another good example where, you know, smart government funding often in partnership with the private sector, we need to do a lot more of that. I, I don't think it's just, let's hope the private sector does it and we'll keep our fingers crossed. The last quick point is, you know, the simplest thing we could do to support the private sector would be to double the research and development tax credit. Uh, we, when Re Reagan was a huge supporter of the R&D credit and, and uh, it was signed into law in 93, 83, and for many, many years, we had the most generous research and development tax credit in the, in the world. Uh, we issued a report last September by uh, Jacek Wardwa, who looked at that. And now we're 24th out of 34 countries, including the BRICS. And if this provision in the last tax act goes through, uh, uh, extending uh, the ability to depreciate uh, expense in the first year, we'll go down to 32nd out of 34 countries on R&D tax credit. So, we need a better R&D tax credit to have companies do more R&D. And, and the other last thing I'll just say, that credit not only leads companies to do more, but it changes the location of it. There've been very good academic studies on that that show companies might maybe do a little bit more, but they'll might do it overseas if there's a better overseas tax credit than if there is one here. 
Well, so that gets to attention perhaps with Jim, because you are, I think, focusing on the need for doing the research domestically um, as opposed to necessarily having an open system where research could take place anywhere and we could take advantage. So Jim, do you wanna um, comment on whether there's a tension between what Rob is saying and what, what you just said? Well, we need to protect uh, the technology created by the US and its allies from China. And so China has the most aggressive technological espionage campaign in history, largely because of the internet. Uh, you know, sometimes the Chinese will say, well, America stole technology in the 19th century. Even if that was true and it's debatable, um, we didn't steal entire libraries, but we need to work with our allies. And the idea that we have a monopoly, which is not what Rob is saying, that we have a monopoly on research and innovation would be mistaken. So how do we develop uh, these kind of partnerships? How do we develop both the protections to make the partnerships work, but also the structures, the mechanisms? Well, this is very difficult. And you have lots of people talking about a D10 or a T12 or some kind of tech alliance. Um, not a big fan of those because alliances are political, not based on technology. But there are shared political values that we can build on to have a common innovation base. Uh, some Europeans will say, I was on a conference, in a conference with a French speaker said, well, it wasn't in the US interest to see Europe be strong in innovation. And so it was nice because I felt like the spirit of De Gaulle lived on. But of course, it's in our interest to see a strong Europe. They're, they're valued democratic partners. Uh, they are a good source of ideas and research. They aren't always good at commercializing it. Um, and they're good customers, right, as we are for them. So how do we design a system that is not as national as it once was? There's problems. Having done this as a child, you get into huge fights over intellectual. Who owns the intellectual property that research produces, right? And the, the agreeing to jointly do research is easy. Agreeing on who shares the, the end results of that research is really hard. But there's ways around that, right? And we need to start exploring that. How do, we, how do we make an open multilateral system work? When I think about AI, yeah, Shenzhen and Beijing are strong, but you also want to look at Tel Aviv, you want to look at Cambridge, uh, you might want to look at Berlin and Stockholm. Um, you definitely want to look at uh, Canada. Um, we would do better if we can find a way to work jointly. I just say I 100% agree with Jim, and I, I, you know, we've proposed things, and I, th I think it actually is a little easier than you think, Jim. I think the way to start that is we have certain programs. So, for example, we have Manufacturing USA program, and Canada has their super clusters. Why couldn't we participate in their programs, and they participate in our programs? What I, the only thing I worry about with this is historically the U.S. has been willing to give up its economic and technological advantages in exchange for countries giving us a national security and foreign policy benefits. And we can no longer afford to make that trade. Uh, if we're gonna work with our countries, it has to be, like the UK, for example, would be quite interested in working with us, but we need to make sure it's pretty reciprocal that we're getting as much as they're getting. If uh, just a quick two finger on that first, um, having done this in real life, it's harder than it seems, right? And you get down to the end product. So let's not underestimate that too. Um, I'm not sure everyone in the world would agree with you that we, the, you know, the noblesse oblige of the US. And so when you talk to the Europeans now, or even a good example is NVIDIA and ARM. Now there's a lot going on there, but the Europeans are not ready to fall into our arms and swoon with joy about being partners. A political issue, this administration has done really well at starting to repair it, but it's, that doesn't mean it's repaired. So does that mean, are you both of you suggesting, I mean, you have slightly different views perhaps on how easy it will be to engage our democratic allies, but are you suggesting a, a significant decoupling from China in terms of our economic systems? Um, and Jim, I'll start with you first, um, and because some have suggested it, and I don't know whether you're willing to go that far. You know, there's two things to think about. The first is uh, both sides get a vote. China has decided to decouple. Right. And that is the intent of their policies and funding. 
So we could sit on our hands. All we would do is accelerate that decoupling. China intends to produce indigenous industries and indigenous universities that rival or surpass the US. Um, I don't think that's gonna change. Th that makes the question, um, should, okay, so we, do we decouple entirely now, which was what some in the previous administration wanted? No, that's insane. But how do we have sort of a glide path that gets us to an eventually decoupling, assuming there's no change in the part of Chinese behavior? Um, how do we get there in the ways that are least damaging to American innovation and American security? A complete cutoff doesn't make any sense, but there are places where we're going to need to tighten up in response to Chinese action. <laughs> yeah, I 100% agree with Jim. I mean, first of all, they, you know, I feel like a kid in the third grade. They started it, um, but they did. There's no question if they started in 2006. Um, I think a couple of things, you know, in the Trump administration, there was this view on their part that we should just not sell them any chips, for example, even chips that weren't going to be used for anything related to military. And the, the Trump people would say, well, they're going to cut you off eventually. Why not just take, to take the cut off now? Uh, I'll tell you why not, because that is valuable revenue to our companies where we deny their companies valuable revenue. And the longer we can do that, the better we are. So I'm, by the way, to make it clear, I'm not talking about export controls on military or sensitive technologies, but the idea that we would decouple in a way of not exporting to them is just to me ludicrous. We should, that's why I think Google, if they want to, should be praised to go back into China, even with, uh, even if they have to censor. We want to challenge every single yuan dollar <laughs> in the Chinese market with our companies being able to take it. I do think that there, we should be encouraging, uh, and I use the word encourage, um, decoupling when it comes to production in China, because that's quite different. We just wrote a report on why there is this real new opportunity for an Indian US uh, relationship. Um, very hard, I get all that, but we should be thinking about, could we be working with allies or countries like India and Vietnam? And lastly, there's no reason we couldn't do this for reshoring. I, I proposed a recent idea where companies could get a, a, a tax credit uh, for bringing back work from China if they put it into what's called the high la uh, labor surplus area counties with high unemployment rates. Why don't we do something like that? Uh, there are, you know, I'm not gonna say it's all of production, but there's production that's on the margin where it's sort of cost competitive with the US. And if we could bring it back and then add in labor force training programs and other things like that, you know, we should be doing that. That's what, that's what uh, Abe did in Japan. Uh, that's what Taiwan did. Um, and it was quite you know, reasonably successful for what they did. It's worth noting there was a quickly that there was an OECD report a couple of years ago on subsidies to the uh, semiconductor industry. OECD, of course, is against subsidies because they're market distorting, but the study showed that of the 11 countries with major semiconductor industries, 10 of them use subsidies. Want to guess who number 11 was? <laughs> yes, it we, was us. <laughs> well, that's because we understand the value of the free market, and that's why we're going to win the semiconductor race by doing nothing. Hey, Rob, that's my line. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that teases up very nicely because you, you both have been very focused on the semiconductor supply chain and clearly you both think that that there is some role for federal government in terms of subsidizing um, some aspects of that supply chain. So could you talk a little bit more about which particular pieces of the supply chain you think government should intervene in? And um, let me just throw out one thing, which is that at least in semiconductor manufacturing equipment, the United States appears to still have the lead. So how does that fit in with your general view that the United States has dropped the ball a little bit? Well, I'll go first. I don't think we've dropped the ball. Okay. We have a 45% market share. That's twice as much as our nearest competitor. If you were going to complain, and this gets to Rob's point, uh, a lot of the production has either been moved offshore. We're dependent on TSMC and Samsung for fabrications. So we haven't dropped the ball. We're the global leaders. And if you look at semiconductor manufacturing equipment, if you look at semiconductor design, uh, we're the place in the lead. And so what do we want to do to strengthen that? And some of it gets back to, I know this is the theme that we've been saying over and over again. Some of it gets back to R&D. 
Some of it gets back to subsidies, including tax credits to get people to relocate here. Um, realize that it's more than a fab, right? So people tend to obsess on, I want a fab and, you know, pick someplace in Kentucky. I don't care. Um, it's more than a fab. It's a whole complicated supply chain. And the issue before us is how much do we want to sort of de-globalize the supply chain that has proved so profitable? The other issue that comes up is, you know, Taiwan, TSMC, uh, very close to China. What if Xi Jinping wakes up in a bad mood and decides to invade China, uh, invade Taiwan? Um, so are we vulnerable there? Uh, good question, but how do you increase the capacity that TSMC and Samsung have? And do you want to increase it in the US? And how do we build the supporting uh, elements of the supply chain, materials, testing, design? How do we strengthen them? So I don't think we've dropped the ball. We just want to rethink how much do we want here? Where do we need to spend to expand it? So I think we have dropped the ball. Uh, Good, I'm glad you're disagreeing yeah. on something. Yeah. And we've dropped the ball in, 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 in a number of different ways. One is we, we are flying blind. You know, we really don't know what the US supply chain looks like uh, in, in advanced technology areas. Um, somebody told me recently, and I could be wrong. No, they could be wrong, that we are ma we're importing gunpowder or bullets from China for our weapons. I, I have a hunch that's probably not a good thing for us to be doing. Uh, so we don't, we simply don't know what our supply chain looks like. We don't know what the vulnerabilities are because we, we have de-invested in the federal government capabilities to do that kind of analysis. Second, you know, Jim, yes, we have 45% of the market share, but we only have, I don't know what it is, 12, 13% of the production. And I, that didn't used to matter when China was our good buddy. It matters now uh, if, you know, if China were to take over Taiwan, I just read that book 2035 or whatever, you know, the new world war, the new, the new China US war scenario book, pretty fun book. Uh, they take over China, they take over Taiwan. That's a huge problem because they, you could say, well, it's in their interest to sell us chips, of course, until it's not in their interest. So we, we can't be dep that dependent. That's why we have to have incentives. And I don't care, frankly, if it's TSMC who builds that supply fab and supply chain network here or Intel or Samsung, hopefully all three will, will build it here. So I, I think that, you know, the idea is somehow that here's the response of people when they hear that, well, we should let the market work. You know, I used to work for a state governor a uh, long time ago in economic development. And um, the idea that a state wouldn't put in place incentives to attract investment in the US, uh, you know, you, you only gotta be, you gotta be like Brownback to believe that, the kind of thing. And, and you look what happens, you know, nobody invests in your state. So you only have two answers. You could say, let's get a national law or a pact that would outlaw all state subsidies for relocation. Okay, yeah, good luck with that. It's never going to happen. And obviously at the world level, even worse. I mean, you have the OECD uh, pact on export financing that everybody agrees to, uh, except one country over in Asia that has over a billion people that doesn't agree to that. So they, they just put export subsidy financing on everything. So obviously we can't unilaterally disarm. If you want to unilaterally disarm, then we should just admit that our core industries are going to be waste paper and tourism will be the dominant players in the world in that. Great. Maybe one footnote. I used to work for an Air Force general. And so, and I say this when it comes up, but if, if there are people who think that if they can invade Taiwan and therefore get TSMC, what they would actually get is the smoking rubble. So let's not underestimate that part of the discussion. This is a strategic discussion. It's in our interest to expand capacity here in the US, but invading Taiwan, not a good idea if the goal is to get TSMC. That sounds a little brusque, but tough. And China, you think, is well aware of that? I should hope so. OK. Well, so we're both, uh, both of you are talking in fairly techno-nationalist terms. Are we now in an era of inevitable techno-nationalism, with the exception of perhaps trying to work uh, to some extent with our allies to the extent that we can get them to be um, cooperative and uh, from our perspective, uh, play fair, if you will. Um, 
would you characterize this era that we're entering as one of techno nationalism? You want to go first, Rob? Yeah, thank God it is. It's about time. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, Trump was right, America first. And, and just to be clear, I, what I mean by that is, yes, we should work with our allies. Yes, we shouldn't be, you know, totally protectionist. Sure. There's a sort of slider gradation of all of that. But we're so far on one side, historically we've been, which is we don't care about anything. Potato chips, computer chips, what's the difference? You know, what people forget is where did I, ITRI come from, the Industrial Technology Research Institute of Taiwan? Where did it come from? Critical institute that played a key role. It came from us. We paid for it. We funded it. Where did South Korea's technology programs come from in the 60s? They came from us. So we can't think that way anymore. We have to be thinking about a US advantage. And we need to be pushing not just against China, but frankly, against Europe. I mean, you look at what Europe is doing with this nonsensical digital sovereignty thing. I'd be willing to take Europe, Europe seriously if they decided to end their $160 billion trade surplus with us. Okay, you end that trade surplus, then we can have a conversation about your digital sovereignty, but you can't let us have a billion dollar trade surplus with you on advanced digital technologies. We, we're not even allowed to do that. So we got to understand many, if not most of these countries out there, again, it's like this, it's like this incentive thing. They're looking out for themselves only. So we've got to do a little bit more of that. But at the same time, we are in a different position. We do have to exert global leadership to try to bring our allies together, but we shouldn't do it at the expense of us giving up our core interests. Wow, Rob is more nationalist than me. Rob, I spend every morning on the Zoom call with Europeans telling them how we need to work together. And they say, <laughs> but is this gonna be America first? And I say, no, of course not. Why would you think that? <laughs> uh, we're in a very different situation than we were 10, 20 years ago. And the feel of globalization is different. And it's, it's in some ways over. We are in an era of techno-nationalism. But we have a, a, a gigantic opponent and we would be better off uh, working, in my view, working with our allies to come up with a common approach. The Europeans are definitely techno-nationalist, but they're also having a debate. How much do we, you know, and it's funny when you ask them, you say, um, okay, so when you say techno-nationalism, one of them told me that means no China and it means we're not dependent on the US. And I said, well, that doesn't sound like a partnership. And they got all flustered and say, no, no, what they mean is it's, we need to be working. We, that might be their view. I agree with Rob, but our job is to change that view and to persuade them of the benefits of partnership, right? It's a different world. We could use some partners. If, if I could just quickly add to that, I, I don't disagree with that, but I really, really worry that we are, there's so many Atlanticists in Washington that we're gonna say, oh, we gotta rebuild that alliance at all costs, including letting Europe go forward with its digital sovereignty agenda, its digital services tax, its anti-US antitrust policies, its digital markets to act, which is again, anti-US. So yes, but this is a relationship like a marriage and each side's gonna have to give a little bit. So they're gonna have to give if they, in my opinion, if they wanna be able to work with us, that's how I like, we should approach it. De definitely some anti-Americanism when you talk to people in Brussels. So Rob's right there. The difference is we need a better line. I mean, we can't, it can't be trust the market, the market will save us. And it can't be, you know, the internet should be open and free. It's unpersuasive, right? So we need to come up with some new lines to rebuild that partnership. But we sort of agree at the start. I don't know as we go on the path if we agree, but uh, please don't say open and free. <laughs> So that that the your your reference to open and free did lead me to the question of you know what's happening in the United States internally in terms of our domestic politics is I think there is a, a trend towards um, you know uh, being more suspicious of of big is beautiful if you will Rob um, to cite the title of your book in fact there's a trend towards wanting to. Um, think that big is, is, is our enemy. And so when, when we talk about our big US big tech companies, is the domestic political agenda that may be gaining some traction going to create problems for our international competitiveness agenda? Yeah, um, and sorry for the little background noise, there's a lawnmower on my neighbor's lawn here. Um, 
I think it will. Um, the I think what you have to understand about what you can term the neo Brandeisian shift in antitrust, and again, that's 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 a very significant shift. That's not to say that sort of the Obama, Carl Shapiro approach to antitrust is what's being attacked. Is what's it's what's trying to replace it. No, no, uh, it, it's not the sort of yeah maybe antitrust could be a little bit more aggressive and this and that. No, this is a ch fundamental change in antitrust policy that that the uh, Barry Lynn's uh, and Lena Khan's of the world want to put pl put in place. And the tip of the spear is oh big bad tech as a monopoly. I don't think anybody should be fooled. It's about all big companies. It's about large corporations that have more than say twenty percent market share. That would be disastrous uh, if we go down that path. And just to be 100% clear, as Artie, you know, because you've done work in this space, the big difference between conduct and structure. We should be focusing on conduct aggressively. Bad conduct is bad for innovation. It's bad for competitiveness. It's not the same as saying big structure is inherently bad. In fact, there's lots and lots of evidence that we review in our book. Big companies are just as innovative as small. Um, they play a key role in competitiveness. So I think that would be, a, I, I do see that as a big risk going forward that we're gonna attack our big companies just for being big. I mean, look what, look what China did, for example, with its rail companies. We just came out with a report today on high-speed rail innovation and how the Chinese policies have damaged high-speed rail innovation, particularly Europe and Japan companies. They created this, basically this national champion, uh, this behemoth called CRRC. They forced two state-owned companies to merge into being even bigger. Why'd they do that? Because they want global market share and they think scale's the way they're gonna get it. Yeah, and the same is true in semiconductors where the Chinese policies uh, divert revenue from the most productive companies to less productive companies. So China's uh, interventions actually hurt global innovation. But on this topic, so 1900, a lot of big companies, Standard Oil, the electrical industry, and the answer was big's okay, but we have to regulate. Okay, now fast forward a century, uh, regulation bad for innovation. And you can probably make a fair case that one of the reasons Europe doesn't have a strong tech industry, it's beginning to reemerge, but one of the reasons they don't have a strong tech industry is because they overregulate it. So the old solution, the early 20th century solution doesn't work. So what do we do? Are there benefits to having national champions? Oh, I think so, right? And that's where Rob and I agree. But we're going to need to say old ideas don't work when it comes to antitrust, and we're gonna need new rules. And the new rules might be about behavior, it might be about meeting some of the European concerns. Uh, it might be about transparency. Uh, it might be about paying taxes, right? So there's a lot of room to address the big company problem. Breaking them up, um, you know, people point to Ma Bell. I'm not sure that's the right precedence. Ma Bell was one of these late 19th century regulated monopolies. Right idea uh, for then, not the right idea now. I'm not, I don't know if you agree, Rob, but I don't think, would you say that, that any of the companies have a monopoly? They're very competitive. When if you look at, what do they call it? GAFA, right? Very competitive. Uh, they would gladly uh, trample the other. Um, that's what we want, right? And so sometimes people don't complain about success and don't think that doing something at a time when China is consolidating its companies and establishing greater control over them. Um, we're going to need national champions, but we'll need a new playbook for making them uh, play nice with us and with the Europeans. Well, the term national champions, you, you both used it now. So that does um, create this uh, kind of concern, I suppose, it's that, that, that at the end of the day, the government then will be engaging in in not only picking the winner, but accelerating the the pace of the winner, and um, you know, with all the po the possible market distorting effects that could have, and so is it worth it just for purposes of competing with China to create a system that is very different from the one you know that that we've historically had? It's one thing to have even industrial policy, but have national champions seems one step beyond industrial policy. So I wrote a piece last week on, uh, on it was on a, a, a 
think, think tank that I, I, I submit to, uh, 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 and it was, it's American Compass, it's called. And I wrote a piece on why US industrial policy doesn't mean we have to become like China. And I had sort of a, a, a four boxes, if you will, sort of laissez-faire on, on one side, uh, supporting um, what are called factor conditions, uh, you know, basic science skills, that sort of thing. Moving on to this next third one, which is picking key sectors and key technologies. And then the fourth one all the way over in, in terms of amount of intervention would be picking very narrow technologies and specific firms. I don't believe we should or need to do the latter. I wouldn't, I don't think the government knows enough to say that I think Ford is going to win the EV race and not G GM. I mean, we don't know. We don't know enough about batteries. Is it going to be lithium? Is it going to be something else? We don't know. We, we do know that batteries are pretty critical to our future. We know that the electric vehicle industry is pretty critical to our future. So I think absolutely we should be picking key, in, like semiconductors, key industries, key technologies we have to compete in, and then let the marketplace work itself out in terms of who to get advantage in that. The one area that I would though say we should be picking winners more of, and that's when it comes to regulatory policy. So for example, the recent antitrust case against Qualcomm, um, one of the reasons that, that, that I think it was maybe DOD intervened uh, was because of US competitiveness. And I think our antitrust policies frankly have to consider competitiveness. If, I wrote a long article for the Journal of American Affairs called Who Lost Lucent? And it was a history of how we went from being number one all the way, actually number one starting in 1887, all the way to 2000. And one of the reasons we failed was because the antitrust division kept trying to break up Western Electric and did break up Western Electric. And what was interesting, and then later on Bell Labs, and like what was interesting though, the biggest opponents to that was, the, was DOD. So in the, F, in the first New Deal, uh, FDR tried to break up uh, uh, AT&T and then the war intervened and then the Defense Department was like, you know, there's no way you're breaking up AT&T, we need them for the war. They tried it again, DOD again intervened. Uh, and then by the 90s, DOD lost power and the neoclassicals took over. So I think we've got to be careful in antitrust. That's my point. I, again, I'm not talking about sort of not doing anything because I don't mean that, but we need to be aware of how much we could be harming companies that are going to go out in the battlefield with China. Well, it, just as a footnote, uh, right before they went bank, a few years before they went bankrupt, uh, Lucent's board uh, voted to buy uh, buy themselves a golf course, a company golf course, a uh, country club. So it wasn't entirely bad old antitrust regulators. You also had the dot com boom, but the the general points are, and I don't know if I would not hold DoD up as the. Uh, as the paragon of uh, innovation these days. Important, but when you look at their acquisition systems, uh, they're a bit slow and they tend to discourage innovation. That can change. And so Defense Innovation Unit has done some good work here. Um, but the bulk of the money still goes to the conventional uh, acquisitions, you know, for aircraft carriers and airplanes and not for new technologies. Uh, so if we can change that, that would be good. But, um, you know, where should government invest? And one thing we've learned is that markets do better at picking investments than governments, right? And so how do we find a way that takes advantage of that? We don't wanna copy China. In the long run, I think China's kind of handicapped. I'm pleased to see Xi Jinping extending government control because it gives us a little more time to catch up. But that's not to say there aren't problems. And so you might want to think about uh, where is government policy necessary? Let the markets pick uh, what you want to invest in, but for commercial purposes. And then find some way to let the military harvest that commercial innovation and find some way to strengthen it. And that's all of what we've been talking about, more R&D, better laws, subsidies in some cases. It's a little bit of a different approach, but I will say a very Chicago school thing, markets beat governments when it comes to investment. Yeah, I have to disagree with you, Jim here. And, and, and I think oftentimes that debate is one of sort of caricatures or cartoons like, oh, the government picking the sin fuel thing. 
reality is, first of all, the government has picked technologies that you know, are amazing that, the, that we would never have. I remember being at a, at a salon dinner one time, and I won't say who it was. You and I both know this person. They were from a very libertarian free market think tank. And they said, I don't know why we're talking about the role of government in picking technologies. I mean, just look at the internet. That was the private sector. Oh, okay, I guess I missed that. But more, more seriously, though, my, my favorite economist is a guy named Dick Lipsy, Richard Lipsy, and, and, and he and, and Ken Carlaw have a new report, uh, or a longish report coming out. Very fascinated history over the last 200 years on the government role in intervening and, quote, picking technologies, when it works, when it doesn't work. One of the key points they make and others is there is almost always some kind of externality or spillover from an R&D and from an R&D investment and companies don't capture that. So if you look at, for example, the CAT scan, if we rely, I mean, we did rely on the market for the CAT scan and luckily it happened, but the, the, the social rate of return from the CAT scan was much, much higher. And so I do think that the government knows enough to say, look, we know these technologies are going to be critical to the global, global future, to our future. Things like AI, autonomous systems, genetics. I mean, think about, hey, why did, why did, why did, we, pick, uh, why did we pick mapping the genome? That seemed like picking a technology. So my point is, I don't think we have to sort of pick this either or. Of course, at the end of the day, private sector has to be the ones that picks the actual thing that actually makes those big investment risks and choices and, and manages them well. But the government can and should sort of go in certain directions and support the private sector in going in those directions around technologies. Well, we want to think about what are the what are the guideposts that would point to what direction they wanted to go in. And in the past, we depended heavily on national security to come up with these things. So the internet started out in the late 60s or early 70s as a technology to ensure communications after a strategic nuclear exchange, right? We don't have that in San Jose anymore. And having been involved in the commercialization of the internet, um, in some ways, yes, government identify stuff and then give it to the private sector and let them run with it. And you get a lot more. So we need some sort of balance. Uh, I'm not saying the government should never spend, but the government needs to be clear about what it wants. Um, there may be what we call commercial or civilian technologies now, like, and I think you're gonna to come to this, um, electric vehicles, where the market probably won't move fast enough. Government probably does need to intervene. Uh, the market may not deal with China's predatory policies when it comes to batteries and battery materials. What we need is a balance though, and to say, rely on the private sector, that's not right. Rely on the government, that's not right either. I mean, if the choices are between the Cato Institute and the People's Republic, I and mean, there's gotta be something in between. Sorry well, to my will... friends at Cato. I think it's, it's CSIS, uh, Center for Innovation Policy and ITIF. There you go. There you go. That's where we are. We're, we're right in the center. Um, so I have just a couple more questions before we turn it over to a more general Q&A. One is a, a very specific one, and then I'll close with a much more general one, but I'll give you both right now so you have a sense of where things are going to head. Um, the Endless Frontier Act in particular has chosen NSF as a locus of investment. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on NSF. We've talked a lot about DOD, but NSF is where the Endless Frontier Act, which seems to have a lot of support right now, is choosing to put a lot of its firepower. And then finally, because we are at least virtually in a university setting, I wanna talk a little bit or ask you a little bit about what you think the role of universities should be in all of this, because as you well know, we've historically in the university context had at least for the last you know, 30 plus years, a fairly um, open system where um, researchers can come in from all over the world and, and do all sorts of things. And universities I think have enjoyed the benefits of that. But you know, one of the questions becomes is that system, that very open system, any longer sustainable? Um, and are there any red line rules that we should create with respect to cross-border collaborations, again, perhaps particularly with China? So those are the two questions. And I will let uh, Jim start and then Rob, you can- you, you want me to do both at the same time? Or? Yeah, why not? Okay. Yeah. So in uh, in, 
in the 90s, uh, when government spending was being slashed, particularly on R&D, the one area it wasn't slashed was the National Institutes of Health. And you mentioned this in your opening remarks is, I think NIH now gets about five times, maybe more than what NSF gets. Mm -hmm. um, that was a mistake. That's part of why we're here, is they should have both been set at the same levels. Uh, we can fix that and endless frontiers will help fix that. I, you know, I have mixed feelings about the name change, but uh, otherwise the idea is strengthening NSF. And one way to think about this is you have some of the best researchers in the world in America, and they spend 30% of their time filling out grant applications, mm -hmm. which do not have a 100% probability of success. That's what we call an inefficiency. <laughs> That's what we call friction. Get rid of that. They shouldn't be doing so much. So yes, strengthen NSF. Uh, for me, that would be crucial. Um, openness has been to our advantage. Uh, and so we need to, Reagan, here we keep coming back to him, don't we? He had an intense debate. Oh, I forget when, Rob probably knows. The early 80s about, uh, should we classify and restrict basic research? And somehow the Reagan administration came to the decision with some unhappiness that basic research should be open. It's been a strength for the US. We let people in. Rob, when did we start talking about it? Every time someone gets a PhD in science, they should get a green card stapled to it. We started talking about that more than 20 years ago and we haven't delivered. So open is the way to go. The one problem here is China. And so we're, we'll need to work through this. One argument would be, well, if Chinese students come here, they might be willing to stay. A huge, that's a big concern for the Chinese government, a huge effort for them to make sure that doesn't happen. If Chinese students come here, some of them will be spies. Some of them will be spies. The solution is not to say no Chinese, is to think more about counterintelligence. And some of it is, um, do we want to restrict in particular areas of research? Can we come up with a more nuanced policy for how to deal with China? This is only a China problem, right? When, when they were doing FIRMA, the investment reform bill, you know, they have this whole complex structure. I said, wouldn't it just be easier if we said no China? It's like, no, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. Um, it would be easier if we could say no China, but then you have these other problems like, Universities get off from China. There are areas that if some Chinese individual wants to come here and study uh, something in the social sciences or in the humanities, we should welcome them with open arms. Uh, if they want to study science, we probably need to do a little better job of screening them. We need to think are there areas we don't want them involved in. But overall, we should try and maintain as much openness as possible. One of the rules of thumb I use is um, would we have let the Russians do this in the Cold War? Would we have let the Russians put a uh, insert into the Washington Post with Pravda? Well, People's Daily does that, by the way. We probably wouldn't have allowed that. And so we might want to think a little bit about mm, how do we tighten up? But tighten up doesn't mean strangle. So I'll stop there. So I will start with that one first. I agree with almost everything Jim said there. Um, I would make it uh, harder for Chinese to fund research at our universities, if not impossible, whether it's, it's, it's funnel, it's usually, it's often government money funneled through the private sector, but I just wouldn't, I just said no more. You can't, you can't take that because it comes with strings. Um, I would also push for more Indian students. I, I think if we can replace every Chinese student we replace with an Indian student, I think we're much better off. I think it builds the alliance and the partnership we need with India. Um, and I agree with Jim, some Chinese students are spies, not all of them. Um, maybe we could make it so that all Chinese students go to law school here uh, and then send them back to China. <laughs> and then in 20 years, we'd be in good shape. Um, with regard to Endless Frontier, <clears throat> by the way, Jim, the new version doesn't have the name change. <laughs> they took that out, so. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> um, look. If, if I were czar, I wouldn't have done it exactly that way. Um, NSF has its own mission. It's a very good mission. It does it very well. And that's PI-based universities, exploratory research. We need that. We need more of it. We should double it. They don't do as well the sort of a more applied, purposely focused research that's over oriented to commercialization. And the core question here is, can that legislation 
have the right guardrails and incentives. And I have to say the new version coming out of Commerce Committee has some much, is in my opinion, much better than the original version. It has some of those guardrails, for example, uh, requiring some industry funding for some of these university research centers. I think that's critical. And then the second question is, is NSF really serious about wanting to operate that program in the spirit it's intended? Or are they just gonna use it as another way to just give academics money for doing whatever they want? Which again, to be clear, just to be clear, we need to double the NSF budget for that sort of thing. But there is this other mission that we have to do as well. So I don't know. Um, I also probably would have put a little bit more of that money over into NIST um, with some of the NIST manufacturing programs. Hopefully that can happen with some uh, interagency agreements and the like, but uh, look, the idea that we're going to pass potentially pass this bill thrills me, uh, including that it's including in there some an idea that we ITIF came up with for these regional innovation hubs. So I'm I'm super thrilled. These are more criticisms around the edge than at, certainly at the core. Terrific. Well, now we are going to move to the more direct Q and A uh, version or, or uh, section of our program. And um, so Dennis and Stuart are going to come on and. They have loaded up some questions from the audience for the two of you. Um, great. Let me let me uh, start. So here's a, one of the questions notes that um, Trump administration took uh, steps toward banning foreign ownership of TikTok. One thing you all have not talked about is, you know, in light of the long history of banning of foreign ownership in various sectors, banking, communications, uh, transportation. Um, how you see that interacting with innovation policy. I mean, maybe you think it's a relevant innovation policy and that it's, it, it should be thought about entirely on other grounds, but I'm just, I'm, I'm curious on that, on, on the money flows in, or, or the questioner is curious on the money flows in what your, what your take is. Well, I, I did a lot of work on uh, TikTok. Uh, and so I never thought it was a national security risk. TikTok offering financial services, or it's actually bike dance TikTok's owner. That could be a different story because of the access. And so if you think about, if you remember Ant, we blocked them from acquiring an American financial services company, but TikTok itself, uh, uh, having watched hundreds of TikTok videos, looking closely for intelligence advantage, I've been unable to find it, right? So not a big risk. You have two issues though, the, for me, the first is, um, Transborder social media. And this is a problem we, the Indians, the Chinese, uh, the Europeans all have. You have influential wealthy companies not located in your jurisdiction that provide uh, an essential service basically to your citizens. How do you regulate them? How do you address them? In an ideal world, we'd have some sort of global common understanding, but we're far from that. So it's a problem we all confront. Uh, China's approach, of course, is to just ban everything, um, which is elegant, and maybe they can get away with it with a billion people. Uh, so the second issue we need to think about is reciprocity, right? And reciprocity is a word, word that Chinese hate. It's like we do, on, in fact, one Chinese official told me during the TikTok thing, he said, well, it's hard for us to complain because you're basically doing the same things we do to you, right? So I'd say, think about how do we deal with the social media, transborder social media problem? Um, don't have a solution. And then how do we push uh, reciprocity when it comes to, well, we've gotta be grown ups about national security risk. If, if, if you, you can, I really did watch hundreds of TikToks and they're, they're just, I can assure you there is no intelligence advantage. <laughs> If everything is a crisis then, or a problem, then nothing is. And this is a nothing. We've got other things to worry about. TikTok's the least of our worries. We shouldn't be worrying about it. OK, this is a question for Rob. Um, and it pertains to the innovation ecosystem. Um, there's a question about the very aggressive strategies that large firms are using in terms of their acquisition of small firms, uh, some of it very preemptory uh, as a way to diminish uh, uh, current or future competition. How would you deal with that issue, you know, given the fact that the history of innovation shows you need both big and small firms to drive the, the, the frontiers of, of new knowledge creation? 
Yeah. Um, well, thanks. That's a couple of things. One, there was an article, I think, in the Wall Street Journal just in the last three or four days that showed that the amount of venture funding, including early stage startup funding, is the highest it's been in decades or years. I don't know, long, long time. I don't think we have a sort of a predatory or killer acquisition problem here. We, we, the ecosystem is investing. And these are also on internet company startups. So we're investing. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, we wrote a report in a series called Monopoly Myths, looking at this notion of killer acquisition. But you got to understand, I think, in those cases, a lot of those cases are ones where the, the, act, the acquired entity ends up getting scale, ends up being able to do all of these things. Um, uh, one of my friends, a friend of mine, is, was, the, it was the former CEO of Honest Tea, uh, that, that company where, you know, a little company, cool thing. And they sold out to Coke. Uh, Coca-Cola, and they got criticized for it, a killer acquisition. And yet, I mean, I know Seth quite well, and he said, I was able to pay off my investors, and I, we increased our sales by, a, I don't know how much, I'm going to say an order of magnitude because of the Coke distribution. thing. So that was, a, that was one. Another one, there's a really good book called Never Lost Again uh, by a company that started up, it was the one that created the ability to zoom down on, on, a, on a map, a GPS map, and, and then have it keep going out in more and more detail. That's what we take for granted now. It hoped that by, after 20 years, it hoped it would be able to have mapped every single street in the US. This was back in 2002 or so. It happened to be located down the street. So they went from Google, they went and had a meeting with Sergey Brin. Sergey said, hey, we'll buy you. and uh, And in Three years, they did it completely for, for the whole US, the whole world, I mean, now undersea, they did it for free. It was interesting, there was a criticism recently by some Democrats saying how bad this was because it put out a companies like MapQuest and these companies that had to pay like, real estate agents would pay like you know $200 a month or I don't know what it was. And this was unfair to those poor companies. That's where we have to go and say, wait a minute, we've gone too far here. Last point I'll make that is, I do think it's useful for the antitrust authorities to look at smaller acquisitions that wouldn't trigger um, uh, the, the acquisitions uh, you wouldn't normally have tr tr triggered Hart Scott Rodino. So I do think it's useful to look at more of those and then say, well, wait a minute, is this one that is purely about keeping out competitors? You know, everybody, everybody talks about, um, you know, Facebook when they bought WhatsApp, what people forget is WhatsApp charged for their subscription. You had to pay for it. Now it's free. I don't really see what the problem is. So I think it's overblown, but not to say that we shouldn't look a little more carefully at then make sure that they aren't really acquisitions to design to kill the competitor. Super. Jim, did and you want just, to? Just as a footnote, um, Google Earth started out as an NRO project that they transferred to uh, whichever this little company was. So, uh, and it had it remained an NRO project, it would be highly classified and we wouldn't know anything. Um, so the next question is, um, so given the need that both of you have agreed on for the government to direct at least some private R&D uh, uh, and investment efforts, what kinds of controls should government retain over the information outputs that it directs and funds? Well, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure what that's getting as it's a complex question. I think um, there have been push, for example, on by Dole uh, for the government to go in and exert intellectual property rights, uh, which I think is a huge mistake. I think using that as an example, before by Dole, there was relatively little technology being commercialized and spun off and patent licensing, et cetera, from universities um, because there was no incentive for that. So I think that system works well where we, if you fund, Duke or NC State or whatever, uh, the university and the faculty inventor and maybe the company, they can all benefit from that. So I think an overly aggressive approach would be harmful. That's not to say that there couldn't be some things where the federal government is directly involving funding a company like we used to have the advanced technology program in NIST. Yeah, maybe some of that should be royalty based. Uh, but again, if you make that too strong, you don't get any comers. The overall approach should be to, um, I think I'm agreeing with Rob, is uh, this is government creating a public good. Uh, we have a system that others envy and Bidol does need some reform, but why mess with something that's actually been a great strength? Let the intellectual property go. Uh, don't try and have government control it. So 
you know, there might be a few small exceptions, but I'll come back to this mantra that for this kind of stuff, open is good. I, I'm sorry, I would add one more key thing, which I forgot. I do think that the federal government should exert some rules about if you're going to get, and I don't mean to say it has to be on every single program, but if you're going to get government support for R&D, et cetera, if you don't commercialize that in the US, then you got to pay it back. Uh, now, should that apply to everything? No, but it should apply to a lot more. We want to give an incentive for companies, whether they're foreign or domestic, that get help from the US to commercialize and produce in the US would be my view. So I'll just jump in here. Um, uh, I, I do think that Baidu was a very techno-nationalist um, statute. So it is, um, I think, would be appropriate from, from the standpoint of legislative intent, if one cares about that, to, to view it through a techno-nationalist lens. Okay, uh, let's move on. We are, this is an interesting question about what kind of skills and knowledge are needed to really help drive um, this development of a new uh, innovation industrial policy approach. In other words, what would that team look like? Where would it be located? You know, what kind of new uh, innovative institutional format would be needed? Or can the present uh, structures actually you know, deal with that as they currently are, are uh, uh, in place in Washington? Yeah, so I see that that's by my, my colleague, Andrew Reamer at, at GW, uh, George Washington University, who frankly has done more on this question than anybody probably ever alive. Uh, <laughs> Andrew's done fantastic. We're looking at the history of how the US government actually used to know this stuff. It used to actually have capabilities you go, Andrew sent me something years ago about, about, you know, some Commerce Department report from 1912 or something like that. And, you know, the chapter on, I don't know, the foundry industry was the most complicated, detailed, technologically sophisticated chapter on, you know, and this was the government. We do not have those capabilities in the federal government now. The Commerce Department lacks them very significantly, particularly taking data and then putting it into analysis. Even the data we get is not enough. The closest we have that is DOD's Office of Industrial Policy, and they're pretty good at analytics. The problem is that, as it should be for them, everything is through the lens of defense, not the broader question. So we, need, we do need to beef that up. There are two ways you could do it. One would be to significantly expand and create new capabilities in commerce. If you look at commerce, for example, we have the International Trade Administration. So it's okay to do analysis about trade and products but it's not okay to do the analog thing on the domestic side. And that's what we need to fix. And I don't see any way we can get a sophisticated national advanced industry strategy without better analytical capabilities. We're, we're flying blind most of the time. It's worth noting that the office, it was a bureau in World War II. It was the one Nixon worked in. The office that did industrial policy is still there in a much shrunken form. So there's something you could build on. I'm going to take a slightly different tack, which is the way things work in Washington now, you need the White House to lead. And so you need the NEC, you need the NSC. They've already got some of the pieces in place when you look at the people they've appointed. So one of the things I like about this administration is they have a very strong team. Now we've got to work out the agenda. We've got to work out what the policies are we want to pursue. Um, but I think let the White House lead and then think uh, commerce, uh, someplace else, uh, DOD is going to see uh, some changes that are very positive. Uh, we have the opportunity here, but I'd say start with leadership at the top. This is, and this is, this is a good thing. The White House now sees this as a crucial strategic problem for the U.S. They're willing to support money for this. Congress sees it as a crucial strategic problem. So maybe the first thing to do is reflate the existing institutions and then think about how we might want to amend the process. You can do them both simultaneously, but let's not, let's not get boxology get in the way of more funding. So well, I would also add, by the way, because the question was related also to some extent on skills. And I think the most important thing we could do would be to stop assuming that economists know anything about technology <laughs> or industries. What economists generally know about are two things, sort of macroeconomics and microeconomic functioning of markets. Those are important, but they don't really study what 
what you could call meso level functions, industries, sectors, systems. And I, I look, for example, a colleague of mine from McKinsey Global Institute went over for a pretty senior role at the Department of Commerce and I was super happy because those are the kind of people we need more of in government. We need people who have a business background, an industry understanding. Um, we need planners, we need public policy people. Uh, just thinking about only having economists drive the train, I think would be a mistake. One thing I do well, that, in my classes is, is I hold up, I ask people, I used to teach a class on technology and national security at Georgetown. And I would say, if I offered you guys, this is, seniors and juniors, if I offered you a full ride to go into STEM, how many of you would do it? It's usually about 80 or 90% of the class. So one of the things there was, again, Eisenhower, National Defense Education Act, put the money in and students will flow that way. Start building the, skill, the skilled workforce now. Um, maybe NDAA simply reenacting it, probably not the right thing. But we've done this in the past. Students don't take this the wrong way. Students will go, there's money. So if I tell you STEM full ride, will get enough people. Well, it seems, seems that at the end of the day, the un universities are gonna bear a big burden in this, that uh, they have to produce the right people. But at the other end, we have to make sure on the demand side, that uh, people are going to uh, utilize them effectively in those roles. But I think that that's a, uh, that's a great place to uh, bring our program to, to an end today. Um, we've really uh, enjoyed having the two of you. It's really been a great discussion. Um, and I think that uh, not only have we all learned a lot, uh, but we've uh, truly gained some new insights into why this whole area is so complex and why it's so uh, difficult to simply, you know, put a whole new uh, framework in place in Washington, D.C. So uh, stay tuned for more. Uh, as already indicated at the beginning, this is part of a series of conversations that we hope to have. Uh, uh, some will have a panel of two, maybe three, others uh, individuals. Um, I would ask you to please uh, uh, check with our website uh, for the Center for Innovation Policy so that uh, uh, you can see our forthcoming uh, programs. And again, let me thank the, the Center for International and Comparative Law, uh, as well as the staff at our own center uh, for innovation policy for their hard work in helping to put this whole thing together. And of course, thanks to Artie and Stuart for being my partners in crime as we put this together. And the most important are two speakers today who really uh, uh, did fit the bill in terms of giving us a lot to think about as we look forward uh, into the future. So thank you everyone, uh, have a great day. Uh, the recording for this, uh, after uh, we go through our editorial review, et cetera, and uh, it will be uh, placed on the website in about a week's time. So I ask you to stay tuned if you uh, want to listen to any further uh, takes on the conversation that's been, been had today. Well, uh, everyone have a great afternoon, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back at another program. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.